Hello. Yeah, okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Politics and Prose Bookstore. My name is Cloud. I'm an event staffer here at Politics and Prose, where we now host in-person virtual events and supported events, trips, and classes. For a full list of everything we do, please go to our website at politicsandprose.com. First, before we get started today, I'd like to ask you to please silence your cell phones so as not to disrupt the event. When we get to the point for opening the floor to your questions, we've placed a standing microphone right behind this pillar. And please get close because we are both audio and video recording today's program so that you or anyone you know can soon find it at the Politics and Prose YouTube channel. Following the Q&A, we'll have a signing up here at this table. So if you have not purchased the book, we have copies behind our registers up at the front of the store. We ask you to line up starting at the pillar next to the microphone. Once the event is complete, we ask that you please fold up your chairs and lean them against something sturdy to help us out. I'm very excited to welcome Vibhuti Jane to celebrate her book, Our Best Intentions. Jane lives with her husband and daughter in Johannesburg, South Africa, where she works in international development. She began her career as a corporate lawyer in New York City. She holds degrees from Yale University and Harvard Law School. Harvard Law School. She grew up in Guilford, Connecticut. Our Best Intentions is her first novel. Jane will be in conversation with Josh Shu. He is an American attorney and political advisor who served as special assistant to the president and counsel to Vice President Kamala Harris from January 2021 to January 2023. In August 2020, he joined the presidential transition of Joe Biden as director of judicial nominations. And in 2015, he was recognized as one of the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association's best lawyers under 40. Now, please join me in welcoming Vibhuti Jane and Josh Shu. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Josh Shu. Hi, I'm Viv Fabuthi Jane. Um, so I just want to start off and uh, do a quick introduction, and then um, I'll give a couple of thoughts that I had in a book uh, before I hand it over to, to Viv Booty. So Viv and I actually uh, know each other because we used to work together uh, at a law firm. And uh, the, <laughs> that law firm is actually um, the basis of the, the Netflix show Partner Track. Um, and uh, yeah, so. You know, hopefully, uh, at some point, this uh, book becomes made into a movie or a, or a series as well. Um, but the funny thing about it is, you know, I think we all talk about people who are former lawyers. I'm sure at one point or another, um, all of you have said, you know, that I want to write a book or I want to write a screenplay. And uh, none of us actually execute and do that, right? And so I think uh, it's quite remarkable that Viv has been able to write um, such an amazing book. Um, and not just write this amazing book, but it's been reviewed uh, and gotten rave reviews from the New York Times. Um, and so, you know, it's for people who have, have been working hard in other jobs, it's kind of quite a feat to have, have done this. And so um, I just want to kind of congratulate her on all her success in, in writing this book. Um, but uh, let me give uh, kind of some initial thoughts about this book. Um, for me, actually, the book really resonated in part because uh, of two things, right? So one was the immigrant experience. And you know, having been a first-generation immigrant, um, someone kind of who grew up trying to navigate the world between how people perceive you in school and professional settings versus how you're perceived at home, um, I really found the characters really interesting. You know, you have, you have Angie and Anjali, you know, the, the way she has to kind of have that dichotomy with her, her English name versus kind of her Indian name, uh, along with her father, uh, Babur and, and, and Bobby. And so um, that kind of experience really resonated, and it really kind of hit home, um, coming from a very similar town um, as, as the characters here. Um, and the second part was I thought she did an amazing job kind of navigating the, uh, the issues of race, class, and privilege. Um, and I think, um, for those of you who haven't read the book, when you do, um, it really comes through in a way that makes you reflect on it and think about it. Uh, it doesn't really come through heavy-handed. I think it, it makes you kind of really think. And so for me, I picked this book up after I left the White House. And um, I actually just wanted an entertaining read. Um, and at the end of the book, I actually found myself really reflecting on uh, the, the characters and the storylines and really kind of um, feeling a lot of empathy and sympathy with, with the main character and her relationship with her father. Um, so those are my initial thoughts. I'll hand it over to Vib um, to give a little bit of a summary of the book. 
Thanks so much, Josh. Um, and thanks for doing this event with me. Um, Josh was uh, sort of a mentor for me when I started my legal career, so it's so nice to have you uh, do this event. Um, so uh, the book, Our Best Intentions, is my first novel, and it came out uh, earlier this week. So I will um, provide you all with a brief summary, since I think most of you have not had a chance to speed read it since it was published. Um, so uh, Our Best Intentions follows an Indian American working class family growing up, living in an affluent suburb of New York City. Um, the family is comprised of a single father and his daughter, and they get in, they find themselves entangled in a criminal investigation. And as part of that investigation, they are forced to confront uncomfortable questions about race, about class, about what it means to do the right thing, um, who gets to have a voice, and also to deal with their emotional baggage and the things that they've avoided saying to one another. Uh, I've had. I had a really great time writing this book. I didn't know I could write a book. And um, every time I wrote another chapter, it was like a new personal feat. Um, so it's so amazing to see this in print. I really hope that for those of you who have a chance to read it, that you enjoy it, that it makes you think, that it's fun, and that um, the characters you know, help you explore ideas that you're interested by. Um, so why don't I ask a couple questions, um, and then um, hopefully you can do a little reading for the audience. Um, so one is I had talked about actually writing the book. Um, I know me and my friends have often talked about, like, oh, we're going to write a screenplay, and it actually never happens. And so um, what actually inspired you to kind of put pen to paper, and can you talk a little bit about the, the writing process and how you eventually got to writing this book? Sure. Um, so I have loved books ever since I was younger. I think anyone who writes a book is, you know, just an avid reader and always dreams of writing a book, just as you mentioned. Um, I think, you know, I ended up um, going to law school, and I think somewhere along the way, I decided that if I was going to communicate, it had to be um, for my career, and it had to be a certain type of um, reading and writing, and that I didn't have time for creative writing along with my career. So um, when I became a lawyer and I graduated from law school, I just sort of gave up reading for fun. I gave up writing for fun. And then um, in 2015, I relocated from New York City to Johannesburg, South Africa, and I made a career shift from corporate law to international development. And with that career shift, I had more predictable working hours and more predictable non-working hours. And um, I felt a void in my day and evening, and I wanted to do something more creative. So I actually started taking online writing classes. Um, I didn't know that anything was going to come of it. I just wanted to be able to express myself. Um, and then one thing led to another, and I just got in my head that I really want to write a book. I've always wanted to write a book. I'm going to write a novel. And so I started looking for inspiration all around me. I started really analyzing the people in my life, the encounters I had, the conversations I had. And uh, I happened to be visiting my parents one day. I was on in an Uber ride on my way back from JFK, going to Stamford, Connecticut. And I got into a pretty long discussion with my Uber driver. Um, who's also of Indian American descent. And he started telling me about a series of violent incidents that happened in the public high school of the Westchester town where his children went to school. And I remember my first um, reaction was surprise because I thought this was a really nice town and that they had really good schools. And um, I remember also being a little bit surprised at the way we were talking about um, the public school. I mean, this whole idea of public schools being nicer if you can afford a more expensive house is just so problematic, and yet we accept that as a given. Um, so anyway, we started talking. Um, the driver started telling me that after all these violent acts started occurring in the high school, a lot of the parents were worried that the, t the town was going down in quality because of an influx of the wrong type of person. And it, you know, I just remember being really intrigued by the way we were talking about this, um, both as people of color, we were talking about ourselves as if we weren't really minorities and we weren't part of the problem, problem in quotes. Um, and so uh, following that conversation, I just had so many questions and so many thoughts. And I started thinking about what would it be like to write about 
a similar incident from the perspective of Indian Americans. Um, what does it mean to have, you know, access to good public schools? Um, in the novel I wrote, um, there's a stabbing that takes place in a public high school, and the main characters are Indian American. Um, and there's questions about the perpetrator not being rightfully enrolled in the public school. And so a lot of the plot was inspired by that conversation. Um, and then beyond that, I knew I wanted to write a book that focused on Indian American main characters. I read a lot growing up, and I never read once was able to find a book with people whose names sounded like mine, whose families reflected mine. And I know that's changed a lot since I was growing up, but I just... It was important to me to tell a story with people who I could identify from my own experience. Um, I think you kind of answered my <laughs> my next question, but that was actually really helpful. Um, no, I, th I thought it was really, um, really amazing how you were able to kind of show and weave into the fact that even in an affluent town, um, there is a huge disparity between who has access and, and privilege to resources and, and whatnot. And so, um, in terms of how I kind of came to it, some of my favorite writers have been those who have written about the immigrant experience, um, Jhumpa Lahiri, and kind of that first generation immigrant experience and how you kind of have to transition. Um, so can you talk a, a little bit about kind of maybe your background um, as, as an immigrant, as a person of color, and how that uh, potentially provided some of the foundation for the book? Um, yeah, sure. So uh, I was actually born in India. Um, my parents are first generation. I guess I'm technically also first generation. Um, but um, I remember growing up in a fairly homogenous, um, affluent suburb in Connecticut and feeling like I had to have two identities, an identity I had outside of the house and an identity that we had at home. Um, I remember feeling deeply embarrassed every time my classmates would come over and they would ask, why does it smell different in your house? What is that food your mom is making and you know I mean not even in um ill-intentioned ways but I just remember being so I just remember wanting to fit in more than anything and just feeling like um in order to do that I had to sort of be a different person outside my house than I was inside and so I think a lot of that is reflected in the story I wrote you have you know an Indian American family who very much want to assimilate because they view that as their path to being successful in America, but who also don't necessarily want to lose all aspects of their cultural heritage. And so I think that's something that I can very personally relate to. I also think as a first generation American, um, you have a unique challenge when relating to your parents. Um, so there's always generation, generational divides between parents and children. But I think on top of that, you have this cultural divide where, you know, I was growing up um, in the U.S. and my parents grew up in India. And so a lot of things in my childhood were not relatable to them. And I think um, that does create difficulty in communicating and in understanding one another. And I think a lot of the tensions the two main characters in this book have is they don't really have the vocabulary to understand one another. And the main character of the father is just really concerned with the economic stability of his family to the point where he's not necessarily able to be there for his daughter emotionally um, when she's going through some pretty trying experiences. So... Um, all of that, I think, sort of resonated from some of my own memories of being um, an adolescent in Connecticut. Um, yeah, so before you start reading, I just want to say that um, the, the last part where I kind of really, the book really resonated and it really felt like it was kind of a homage or ode to kind of relationships between immigrant parents and their, and their children um, and kind of how much they've sacrificed. Um, I know that my parents and maybe your parents um, have taken on jobs when they have first moved to the United States, not necessarily because they wanted to, to do those jobs, um, but it's merely to provide you or me with the opportunity to do what we wanted to do. Um, and I think a lot of times we oftentimes forget what kind of sacrifice that they had to make so we were able to have those opportunities. And um, I, I saw this in many ways as a dedication to that relationship as well. So um, do you want to go ahead and, and do a little bit of reading? Sure. So um, I'm going to read from chapter three. It's one of the earlier chapters in the book where we meet the character of Babur Singh. And um, Babur Singh's life is finally falling into place. 
It's the third Wednesday in August, a mild 78 degrees with a tepid breeze and mostly cloudless sky. The radio blares an infectious pop song about Havana that he can't help but hum and drum his fingers along to. His left forearm and elbow rest against the edge of the open window of his red Prius, and the dark hair on his arms flutters as he navigates midday traffic along the parkway. The day feels ripe with promise and good fortune. Bobber, or Bobby as most know him, is the sole proprietor and founder of Move with Bobby Transport, LLC. The company, and consequently Bobber, is having a record summer. Business is booming in spite of the surging popularity of various on-demand transportation applications, each seeking a non-negligible commission from drivers for use of their respective platforms. In fact, Bobber is en route from LaGuardia, where he dropped off two of his regulars, the Burnett Johnsons, a multiracial gay couple, both of whom, quote, work in finance and, quote, in the city, to catch a flight up to Cape Cod for the long weekend. They'd tipped with abandon, $40 on a $100 ride. Some people have money to burn. Bobber could not help but feel judgmental, notwithstanding his pocketing the generous sum without complaint and with a toothy curbside drop-off and farewell. He does not sacrifice quality customer service on account of others' fiscal irresponsibility. He drives north on the parkway in the direction of the exit for Route 15 and smiles, genuinely this time, as he heads to his next destination, the township of Kichwan. The Sings moved to Kichwan over a decade ago, back when Pernamo was still around, and Angela, then Anjali, had been in preschool. Baba remembers tripping over the peculiar town name, unversed at the time with the ubiquitous commemoration of the area's native inhabitants, who were, so far as Bobber could tell, no longer around to enjoy the honor. Great schools, upscale people, and gorgeous river views. Kichuan is where you want to be, their broker had told them, nodding with approval at the upwardly mobile young family. An earnest, clean-shaven husband, a company man, a product ambassador, a.k.a. salesman, for a biomedical supply company. A formerly slim but softer post-baby wife who nodded agreeably, if not bashfully, as she allowed her husband to do the talking. And an energetic young child with skin the color of burnt sugar and wispy curls of brown-black hair as fine as bird feathers weaving in and out of her parents' legs. It turned out, ten-plus years later, after one intra-town move and one sing lighter, it was... Bobber hums a little louder to the music, decelerating as he approaches a sharp curve. He revels in a favorite pastime, running through his well-crafted daily itinerary in his head. Every task and appointment is already meticulously documented in his daily planner, but Bobber relishes admiring the tidiness and order of it all, finding serenity and purpose in playing back from memory his choreographed life. He plans to spend this afternoon in his home office, a modest but scrupulously maintained ground floor study. He will station himself on his swivel chair before his desktop computer at his particulate board desk, natural wood being out of budget, and who can tell the difference, really, adjacent to a wood composite bookshelf that doubles as a display case, mostly for his daughter's swimming accolades. Fortified by a toasted tomato sandwich and mug of milky black tea, he'll check his email and business Facebook page for passenger requests and then conduct a mid-afternoon status check on his other cars, or more accurately, his other drivers. There is, Bobber has concluded, despite advice to the contrary from his voluminous collection of business-focused self-help books on the bookshelf next to him, Entrepreneurship for Dummies, From Good to Great, Five Star Boss, no management too micro when managing people who work for one's own business. After that, Bobber will tab- tabulate his business account for the month to date, an exercise he does both mid-month and at month's end to keep a real-time pulse on performance. While it's been a bumper summer, he can't take his foot off the proverbial gas. Not now, with an almost college-bound daughter, and not in Kichuan, where any success short of being a Fortune 500 executive, or, say, a hedge fund boss, like his daughter's friend's father, is considered modest. Bobber approaches the stretch of the parkway that runs parallel to the Hudson River. In his peripheral vision, he sees the surface of the water glittering in the afternoon light. He lets out a contented sigh, even as traffic congestion builds in front of him. Bodies of water remind him of Angie. 
She must be training now, he thinks, scanning his car clock and also his phone, which is affixed to his dashboard to see if she texted him back in response to an earlier message he'd sent about dinner. She hasn't. She's probably in the pool. Ever since she was in the first grade, when Barbara enrolled her in a swimming class at the, el- at the community center as a substitute for after-school care, Angie has swum more days than not. She has trained for the better part of the year, every year since middle school. But this summer, she's dedicated herself with such focus that even Bobber, who believes he knows his child better than anyone else in the world, is taken aback by the singular drive of his outwardly understated offspring. Seeing her grit, he agonizes, mostly in the middle of the night, when he has trouble sleeping because his mind seems to never turn off, over whether there is, in fact, any way to enroll Angie in one of the notable year-round swim clubs she has her heart set on joining. Can he cut back his weekend hours and adjust his weekday hours so he can drive her to meets and back and forth from early morning and evening practices? But try as he might, boom summer or not, they cannot afford it. He tries not to panic about it in front of her, assuring her that using the school pool and emailing with the high school coach is as good as a club, but he knows it isn't, and Angie will eventually need better to reach the true heights of her potential. Bobber's phone buzzes and the car in front of him breaks in the same instant. As his eyes flash to the phone screen, a text from a client confirming a pickup at White Plains Airport tonight, he delays applying his brakes and ends up sharply jolting to a halt. A paperback copy of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man that had been resting on the passenger seat falls to the floor of the car. Bobber winces. It's a bad omen for a book to touch the floor. He's been reading Angie's summer books for her advanced English class along with her to help her edit the reaction essays she has to write. He's not quite sure how helpful he's been. Her school is a stark contrast to the open-air government school of his childhood in Hoshiarpur, where English literature study consisted of perfunctory ensemble chants of fire burn and cauldron bubble, and Juliet is the sun in response to the school ma'am's expectant double-double toil and trouble, and it is the east, and... But he enjoys the idea of his otherwise independent daughter needing him and his glimpse of an American education. The traffic is at a standstill, so Bobber unbuckles his seatbelt and reaches for the misleadingly titled book, not a tale of optical illusion and superheroics, placing it back on the seat after touching it to his forehead. He rebuckles and hopes the karmic equivalent of the five-second rule applies. Traffic recommences and he turns up the radio, nodding his head to a slightly crude pop song purporting to share rules for communicating with one's ex-lover. He hopes Angie doesn't start dating until after she leaves for college and that she's able to solicit the guidance she may need in this arena from her professors. He's not equipped to parent his daughter through interactions with the opposite sex, his own experience limited to his tumultuous time with Purnima. Also, unlike other topics that he's uncomfortable navigating, like menstruation and bra shopping, he isn't sure he can outsource this one to their sympathetic neighbor, Colleen Sullivan, one of several women advisors whom Bobber has enlisted over the years to help fill the void of Purnima's abandoned duties. For example... When Angie was 11, Colleen took her to buy her first training bra, using this occasion, per Bobber's insistence, to speak woman to woman to be about Angela's changing body. A great relief to Bobber, even if his daughter seemed less than pleased. Better to learn of such things from another female than from Bobber paraphrasing excerpts from Our Bodies Ourselves. But after Colleen's 4th of July barbecue last month, and her not-so-subtle invitations in the event Bobby gets lonely. He's too embarrassed and frightened to re-enlist her to chat with Angie about dating. Fortunately for Bobber, the subject doesn't yet appear to be on Angie's mind. The closest he and his daughter have come to speaking about relationships was a surprising recent ultimatum that Angie issued when he was researching university swimming programs. As a condition to her leaving home for college, Angie has made her father promise that he will find someone or something outside of work so he won't be all alone. Children these days are so emotionally complex, Baba remembers thinking, feeling guilty that Angie worries about him. He is also caught off guard by her pointed emphasis on someone. The idea of someone after eight and a half years of no one other than himself in Angie burns Bobber's ears. 
It is out of the question. Not a chance that he has time, or even with time, interest. He has Angie to take care of. He is both father and mother to the girl, and it's his obligation, his sacrosanct duty, to ensure she reaches every pinnacle of success. First back to regionals, then to state, then All-American, and then he inhales sharply, stopping himself. No use in tempting fate. No, he thinks. He does not have time for barbecues and picnics, and whatever else, he blushes, Colleen Sullivan had in mind. Besides, under the laws of the state of New York, he and Pernama are still legally married. And although he owes Pernama nothing, not even, he thinks, clenching the steering wheel, a response to her latest audacious email, he can't, he won't, he shouldn't, for his own sake and Angie's, introduce unpredictability into their diarized lives, especially when he's dedicated the last eight and a half years to eliminating just that, especially when things are going well. He'll tell Angie that he'll take up an activity at the community center. A photography class, maybe, he thinks, as his eyes flicker back to the shimmering river on his right. Bobber's thoughts are interrupted by his phone, ringing through his car's Bluetooth. He adjusts his headset and sits more upright, removing his arm from the window ledge before he answers, Hello, move with Bobby. This is Bobby speaking, his standard greeting. Technically speaking, there's a transport at the end of his business's name to avoid, upon the advice of counsel, confusion with a personal trading company in Fairfield. But colloquially, it's move with Bobby. And around the house, or in Bobber's day planner, just move. Hi, Mr. Babar, please? Bobber cringes at the butchering of his first name. It's a woman's voice, not someone he immediately recognizes. This is he. I go by Bobby. Mr. Um, Bobby, this is Mabel Burroughs, Principal Burroughs of Kichwan High School. Principal Burroughs, is everything okay? I'm so sorry to bother you, Mr. Uh, Bobby, but are you driving, Mr. Mr. Singh? I am, yes, but it's no problem, Madam Principal. The school year hasn't even begun, and I see they've already got you on the clock. He lets out an artificial chuckle. The principal doesn't reciprocate. Mr. Singh, I'm calling about Angela. Bobber's heart stops. She's fine. Let me say that up front. His heartbeat resumes, but with gusto. But there's been an um, incident at the high school. What kind of incident? Is she hurt? No, nothing like that. She's not hurt, and she's safe. She pauses. I'd rather not say more on the phone. I think it would be best if you drive here. Can you make your way over to the high school? Bobber checks his clock. It's 2.54 p.m. Give me 10 minutes. Great. I'll see you soon. She hangs up. Bobber immediately calls his daughter. After a few rings, the call goes to voicemail. This is Angela. I can't talk right now, and I don't check my messages. If it's important, text me. Bobber ignores the instructions and leaves a voicemail. Angela, this is Dad. I'm on my way. He hesitates, trying to decide if he should give some, her some advice, like stay safe or don't move, settling on I'll see you soon, and hangs up. He tucks the invisible man farther away from the edge of the car seat turns off the radio, pushes his shoulder blades back, sits at attention, leaning ever so slightly into the steering wheel, and drives. Um, thank you. Um, I think we'll take some questions from the audience now. Um, I, um, I, yeah. Why don't you just go to the corner and then okay. say your name and then Hi. Hey, Bib. My name's Anita, um, and uh, I haven't read the book yet. I'm saving it for a long flight, but I am really curious about your decision to make uh, Bobby Singh a single parent, and because um, that's obviously unusual for, um, I think, the time period or generation, rather, in this country. Lots of social pressure there. Thanks, Anita. Um, it's so nice to see you. Uh, that That's a great question. Um, so I think... There's a lot of sort of stigmas and issues that I'm interested in that I chose to put in the book. And one of them was around some of the stigmas around being separated as a first generation um, Indian American, I think, or, you know, in a lot of cultures, um, including Indian culture, there is a stigma against um, not being married. And that's addressed in this book. I also think it's very rare to see um, in literature, representations of families that don't have a mother, where the mother chooses to leave, and that's what happens in the case of the Singh family. And I think 
we as a society have a lot of expectations of women. Um, and it's almost more common to see families where there's an estranged father who's forgiven and who can be reunited with his children at some point. But we don't really see that same level of understanding or forgiveness for women. And so I, it was just something that felt very natural to me when I was writing this. Um, and that's why I chose to make this a single parent family with a single father. Any other questions? Um, well, if there's no other questions, um, one is uh, a couple of notes. One is Vib and um, the book are going to be featured on Good Morning America. Can you tell us when, when that's going to be? Um, <laughs> March 25th, <laughs> Saturday. Uh, so uh, please pay attention um, and watch it and then buy the book and you know come up. She's going to do some signings, and then we can, we can chat. Thank All you. Right? Thank you, guys. Oh, I, I can ask a question. <laughs> Hi, Vib. It's nice to see you. <laughs> My name is Nadia. Um, I also haven't read the book yet, but I'm curious. The way that you've concluded the book, does it leave it open for a sequel <laughs> or, you know, continued stories of the father and daughter? So... Um, without giving too much away. Uh, I think um, I'm done with, I mean, I think when I ended the book, I sort of told myself I'm done writing about these characters and leave their future to our imaginations. Um, I'm working on another book, but with different characters. Um, I, I think it's, I mean, for anyone who writes, I think it's a really intense relationship that you have because you essentially have these like imaginary friends in your head when you're writing. And I think just for closure, when I finished the final draft of the book, I, I needed to just say, that's it, I'm done. Um, not because it wasn't a great journey getting to know them, but just for me, um, that was the final chapter. Oh, Hey, Vib. Um, I'm Michael. Um, I'm also curious about your writing process. I mean, like, just where did you find the time? Like, uh, are you an evening writer, morning writer? Was it weekends? Did you have, like, a, a schedule or fall into a rhythm? So, um, yeah, I've been asked that by a number of people. Um, it wasn't easy. I mean, I, I really, I wanted to write this book. I did it for myself. I wrote nights and weekends mostly, but for me it was almost like something I looked forward to. Um, there would be like 48 hour periods like over the weekend where I would just tell my husband, please, can you leave the house? I just want to write all weekend. And sometimes I wouldn't even write very much. I would just go on walks and I would think about what I wanted to write. Um, so I think it really is something you do if you are just re like, for me, it was something I did because I was so passionate about doing this that I made it work. Um, this was also before I had a child. So I know a lot of people have said, you just had a baby. How did you write a book? I did not do those things at the same time. Um, but yeah, I think when you want to make time for something, you just find time. Um, I wasn't very disciplined about writing at the same time every day. Um, I also sometimes would wake up at ungodly early hours of the morning when no one else was awake, and also right then. Hi, I'm Suzanne. Thanks so much for coming. I, um, I'm really curious about any internal pressures you might have had. So as an Indian American or Indian now South African, writing about um, a first-generation Indian man, did you feel like you had to play into any sort of stereotype, cultural stereotypes around the Indian culture, Indians, or Indian families? Or did you find that you could just you know, tune that out to kind of what society wants and just write your truth or story? Um, that's a really great question. So, um, you know, the character of Bobber is an Uber driver. And I guess many people could say, wow, that's so stereotypical. You made this this man of South Asian descent um, a job that's, you know, associated with people, with first-generation immigrants from South Asia. Um, but I think... When I think about stereotypes, I feel like stereotypes um, kind of fall away when you give people th a, a treatment as a three-dimensional character. And so in really writing the character of Bobby um, or Bobber, um, I really felt like 
I had to think very deeply about, you know, what does this person eat for breakfast? What does this person do if he walks into a bar? Does he order a drink? Does he go to bars? Um, What does he watch on TV or what radio station does he listen to? And I think if you think about someone's life in such minute detail, you're not as concerned with making them a stereotype because you really are trying to portray them vividly. So I, I don't think I was as concerned about that. And hopefully in reading it, you're left with a very full picture of who this person is. Well, thank you, Vib, um, for the book, for doing this with everyone. And thank you all for, for coming.